The word belief, defined, means to accept something as true. And so when you use this definition of belief, you can believe all sorts of things. Like, for example, I have a tape measure at home. And when I use that tape measure to measure something, I believe that when I extend it out and I measure something, that it is accurate. And so I have accepted as truth what is on my tape measure. So you can accept, you can believe all sorts of things. The beliefs that seem to be much more complicated than whether or not we believe the measurements in a tape measure are, are much more abstract. I believe that one political leader is better than another political leader. You've accepted a truth that one person's way of looking at the world is better than the other. The other is inaccurate, and the one you believe is true. And of course, we're in a church, and, and we talk a lot about a belief in God. We accept the reality of God as truth is what it means to believe in God. And some of you, that comes very naturally. And for others of you, that's something strange and something you've wrestled with for quite some time. I want to ask you a question. I'm not going to open it up, but I just want you to think for a moment. What do you believe? So if it's comfortable, close your eyes. I'll give you 10 seconds. Just what do you believe? Now, if you want an interesting conversation over coffee today, rather than asking your neighbor what their plans are for the rest of the day, ask them what they believe. Let's see what kind of conversation will come out of that. Beliefs powerfully shape our impression and view of the world. Think about when you're a kid the belief in Santa Claus. The, the time I first tested this belief, I think it was out of almost, a, it was like a guess. Maybe a friend had suggested it to me, but I don't really know, I don't really remember. But what I do remember is that I was getting ready for school and my mom who ran a daycare had all these little kids around and, and she was telling them about the impending Christmas rush and that Santa Claus was coming and I said, well, Santa Claus doesn't exist anyways. And she gave me this look like, first of all, shut up. There's a bunch of young kids around. And second of all, maybe a sense of, oh, you're on to something. And for me, it was a rather shocking moment as well because it was the first moment that I'd really tested it and my testing was proving false. This Santa person that I'd come to believe in actually may not have been true. Later on that day, I had a talking with my parents and everything was revealed and I actually think I was quite heartbroken at that idea. And we believe all sorts of strange things, don't we? I think one of the biggest myths that we have is that stuff will make us happy. All those infomercials that have somebody struggling at the beginning, and then they find some magical avocado peeler, and this <laughs> avocado peeler will make them happy. Or they find this, they're uncomfortable, and the blanket keeps falling off of them on the couch, and so they find a onesie made out of flannel that will make them happy. It sounds strange and it sounds funny, but I think it's true. Maybe it's not some sort of gimmicky consumer product. Maybe it's a house or a car or a job. And we believe that these things will make us happy, and so we pursue them. There are so many things to believe that I envision it like a giant buffet a smorgasbord, or as the sign in Ladysmith says, a smorg. You know, there's so many things that we can believe. What do we choose? So I want to bring up these three for a second because 
I'm not going to rail on them like you might think I might. So here's the interesting thing about these three. Right now, voters in the United States are be being given three different options, right? And when somebody jumps on board with a candidate's belief system, it can be very powerful. There's Bernie Sanders. And I don't know his whole platform, but I think it goes a little something like this. There are a lot of hardworking people in the country. And there's a small group of people who control huge financial, economic, and political power. And that if he were president, he would come in, dismantle that system brick for brick, and create a new and just society. I think that's what he's selling. And I think many people are buying it. And I can see why. Another choice they have is Hillary. Now, again, I don't know Hillary's platform all that well, but I think her ideas are something like this. She has so much experience in the halls of power in Washington and elsewhere that she knows the system well enough that if she were president, then she could come in, continue the work of providing affordable health care, work towards equal pay for equal work, further the United States as a place of safety for LGBTQ. And I think that's what her belief system is. And it's very easy to see why many people would be attracted to it. And there's Trump, who, well, I don't even think Trump knows his platform, but he's selling a really interesting idea too, isn't he? If you've ever driven through um, Philadelphia or Detroit or Flint, Michigan, you know what tens of thousands of abandoned homes looks like. And he's, every time he gets up onto that podium, he sells jobs. Because he knows that there are millions of people in the United States who have lost jobs and as such have lost their mortgage and their home and their car and their livelihood. And that makes for very angry people. And I think he thinks that if he gets into office, he will be able to take his negotiation experience and make it so that there are more opportunities for the people who are disaffected. Now, if you've lost your car or your house or your livelihood or your pension because there wasn't uh, enough work for you, that's a powerful, potent message and should not be underestimated. And so there are three choices for people to make. For the record, I think Trump is crazy and it would be so dangerous. Now, the, the idea of choice is one that I think is an ancient struggle. How do we know what is true? How do we identify truth? When we look at this big smorgasbord of things from diets to yoga practices to religion, how do we discern what is true? So I want to tell you a story, actually a couple of stories, about a woman and a son and a resurrection, ultimately to establish a pattern. There are two prophets in the Old Testament who are considered to be the greatest prophets. One is called Elijah, and the other, Elisha. Just a small spelling change in there. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings walks into a town and he sees a woman gathering sticks. And he says to this woman, can you give me something to eat? And she says, not really. She says, I'm out of flour, I'm out of oil, and essentially I'm taking these sticks, I'm going to go home, I'm going to make a fire. I'm going to use the last of the bread and the last, last of the flour and last of the oil to make a little bit of bread for my son and I. 
And then we're going to die because we have no other food. So Elijah goes to her place. And out of some miraculous um, miracle, there appears enough flour and oil to get them through the famine. And not too long after this, the boy gets sick and dies. And the woman is very confused. How, how is it possible that God would get us all the way through this drought with this flour and this oil only to have my son die of an illness? And she takes her complaint to Elijah, and Elijah says, hmm. So he goes upstairs where the boy is lying. And it's, it's a very provocative story, actually. He lies over top of this dead boy. He does this three times, and the boy wakes up. He takes the boy, and he brings the boy downstairs and gives the boy back to his mother. A number of chapters later, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's the prophet Elisha. And there's a woman who has a son. The son dies of an illness. And the woman tells her husband, I'm going to see the man of God. So she takes a donkey and goes to find the man of God. And she says to him, I would like you to heal my son. I know you're capable of it. So the son, so Elijah says, well, I'll just give you instructions. And she says, no, you're going to come back with me. So Elisha goes with this woman back to her home. And again, it's this, this provocative image that Elisha is eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand with this boy. He gets, he gets warm again. And Elisha gets up and he walks back and forth in this room. And the boy sneezes seven times pops back to life. Elisha takes this boy and brings the boy to his mother. In both cases, this resurrection is pointing to these men and is saying that these individuals harbor a special relationship with the divine. It's, it's pointing to their connectedness with God, and then even to their greatness. So fast forward a number of centuries, and there's a story about Jesus. He's done a bunch of teaching. He's done this miraculous healing, as Ruth so eloquently summarized. And as a result of all of this, Jesus has a crowd that is following him. I think the image is powerful. There's this crowd of people following this incredible leader down the road. And then come, coming from the other side is, a, is another crowd. But this crowd isn't probably very happy. In fact, it's probably very sad because there's a woman, a widow, and she's going to bury her son. Jesus looks at this woman and the story says he has compassion on her. So he goes and he touches the stretcher, the bier on which he lies. And he says to the man, get up. And the man sits up. And Jesus takes this man, this boy, and brings him to his mother. Now where two may be a coincidence, three is a pattern. It's really easy to get lost in our scientific brains on this story, right? So easy to think. Well, maybe the guy had a few too many hallucinogenic drugs that lowered his pulse and he was just lying there, but when Jesus came along, the drugs were starting to wear off and boop, he came back to life. But yeah. It's a complicated story to wrap our minds around. But maybe this story is not so much about the resurrection of the boy. But maybe instead it's about the character of Jesus. You see, 
first century people would have known the story of Elijah and Elisha, much like we know the story of Cinderella. Those stories would be so ingrained in their minds and in their thoughts that they would have recognized that when the writer of Luke writes a story about a resurrection of a boy who's given back to his mother, that he's simply pointing to the fact that there's something incredible about this Jesus guy. This Jesus person is connected to the divine in a way that they hadn't seen for years. And so, in essence, when you look at this smorgasbord of things to believe, there's a red flag over the guy, Jesus. There's something special about him. When you're looking through everything to believe, make sure you take a look at him because there's something powerful about his words. There's something powerful about his teaching. His sense of justice and love and compassion in the world. Pay attention to that. I think this story is like a highlighter over the person and character of Jesus. I like to imagine that after this story, Jesus encounters many other funerals on the road. And rather than going and telling the dead person to get up, Jesus simply goes and embraces the woman and says, I'm so sorry for your loss. And then moves down the road. May this story and what you believe work on you this week. Amen.